Um, my name is Travis Thomas, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, St. Mary's uh, University this evening uh, on behalf of the Centre for Bioethics and Emerging Technologies that uh, I'm currently the director of. It's uh, uh, a great pleasure to have my predecessor sitting in the front row <laughs> as, as well and founder of the centre. Um, and uh, uh, this is the second seminar uh, this uh, semester and uh, I'll introduce our speaker uh, uh, for, for this evening in just a moment. Uh, if you haven't got a programme for the entire uh, series there on the table uh, over there and uh, on your seat you've got a leaflet about the... Uh, forthcoming one um, and there are also some leaflets on the table if uh, you've not come across the new bioethics which is a journal that um, is based and edited in the uh, uh, the center and the latest edition of that has just come out on gene editing uh, we've got somebody talking about children with genetic disorders a bit later on in the uh, term but tonight um, the topic is uh, unconscious states. Is there uh, anybody there? Uh, and I'm very, very glad that uh, Dr. Andrew Hanrahan has agreed to uh, come to address this topic. Uh, my colleague Alison Purcell Davis, also in the front row, uh, I think met you at a conference and then uh, we met uh, as a threesome and I think you were due to come for an hour and about two hours later I was still listening to Andrew's uh, stories and uh, I, I know that uh, he will certainly hold the audience uh, tonight. He addresses this very important topic of uh, the care of uh, unconscious patients. So without more ado, I shall hand over to you Andrew. Thank, Thank you for coming. Um, just to say that um, um, I'm, I'm here in my capacity as a consultant in rehabilitation medicine um, with a special interest in disorders of consciousness. I work at the Royal Hospital in Putney. Um, a lot of the science of disorders of consciousness, the art of diagnosing them, etc., all in the public domain, as is the law, um, where you are perhaps, um, um, you are the experts, and I would be in, in, in the personhood of these conditions, and, and a small group like this, I think, is, is, is ideal to discuss things and to have a, you know, a, a to and fro. Um, I can answer the, the, the science behind it, the diagnoses behind it, and I have a view, of course, uh, as a practicing doctor, um, with, 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 with what I think um, is happening in these conditions and perhaps what ought to happen, what ought not to happen. So without any further introductions, I'll, um, uh, some of these might be my personal views as well. These, these are not the views of the Royal Hospital at Putney anyway. This might be my personal views, so, um, so, so just do bear that in mind. So it's taught me how to use it, so I shall use it. Yeah, so that's where I work at the Royal Hospital in Putney. It's on the A3. This is what it was in 1854 when um, th that was the rear gentleman's veranda or porch. And it was started as a social enterprise many, many years ago. Um, the enterprise of it being the charity, how it ran, a not-for-profit organization, and what were the social norms and the social challenges at the time. And bringing it forward to today, I think there are social challenges. It's not homelessness or fallen women anymore. It's uh, supporting a much-loved organization, the NHS and a cherished organisation, how do we support it in what might be a very niche area in complex uh, neurological conditions, the care of these uh, patients in these conditions and their families. Uh, our mission statement is very brief and very clear. It talks about profound brain injury. Uh, brain injury could be classified you know, at the roadside, mild, moderate or severe, depending on your prognosis, whether a CT scan is done or not. And, uh, but there is a category beyond that between severe brain injury and death, and that is profound brain injury, when consciousness is, is itself affected. Okay. Um, we were started about, uh, we're the oldest national charity, I think, in the country, and uh, the statement of Andrew Reid is as relevant today as it was then, and I'll read it out, if we cannot heal all, we must soothe, help and comfort all, and to the last, I cannot endure that any sufferer of the human family should be excluded from human sympathy. Until the mid-90s, we were called the hospital for the incurables. A lot of our patients are still incurable. And, uh, and, and that is how some of the taxi drivers still refer to the hospital when you take a taxi from Putney Station. There are four aspects to this talk. Um, it'll be just under an hour, I think, is it, Trevor? Or, yeah? That's right. And, and uh, four aspects of this talk where I'm, 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 I'm confident and expert in is in the science of disorders of consciousness. Uh, I don't... I propose to, to, to discuss the end of it because I don't know about it. 
Um, it's what I know that I will talk about. Um, the art of assessing the unconscious brain, the law which is the public domain, everyone knows about that. And then of course um, the, the person at the centre of all this and whom it is all about. Okay. Now, the, if you subscribe to the biopsychosocial or the biopsychospiritual social model of illness or wellness as I do, and as all rehabilitationists and all doctors should do, then you would look first at the person who is in this condition. And this person, of course, then has a brain, and there is either a functioning or a non-functioning mind. If you follow a biomedical model of illness or wellness, then you look at the brain first. Okay, so what I would glibly call organologists would look at the brain or the heart or the kidneys, right or left, and, uh, and, and get on with it. But if you're looking at person-centered care, family-focused care, then you are looking at this individual, and then you drill down into which organ might or might not be um, at fault. So there's a brain, there's a mind. The brain is the or, um, the mind, or the mind is the brain in action, as as as, as John Gray would say. And uh, this is encompassed in a person. The brain works as a the, the way I can picture it is as a tandem bicycle with very many wheels spinning along and with the driver and with the brain being you know center stage and persons in disorders of consciousness for example the kidneys produce urine the liver detoxifies the lungs breathe the heart beats but the question is where is this all going so these wheels are spinning away merrily the question is what's happening to the bike what's happening to the journey what's happening to the person who ought to be on the seat okay so, so the brain has a, a central role in that, and then of course we are we are persons, but with social connectedness. We 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 are in in our in our micro cousins in touch with our own families, our partners, and then in a wider society. So this is sort of the second principle of rehabilitation medicine, which would be the international classification of function, where if you look at the brain alone, you only see the impairment, but if you see that impairment and then look at what activities that has then limited that patient or that person from doing, you then immediately follow that with, because of that, or in spite of that, what is their social participation? So the international classification of disease is something all doctors would know, you know, teeming facts about, but the international classification of function, which is the consequences of disease, are not well known. So if we look at the biomedical model and stick at the brain, at the impairments, the paralysis, the lack of speech, the lack of continence, lack of mobility, etc., then we are selling ourselves and our patients short. So if we look at, because of this or in spite of this, what are those activities you can actually enhance? What are those social participatory issues you can actually unrestrict? Then that becomes the true aim of rehabilitation. Okay? So it's to get you back to, as Professor Goodman would say, paying your taxes. Okay? Rehabilitation isn't complete till, you've paid, till you file your tax returns. Um, similarly, it's all about those social roles we cherish, okay, what I pithily call leisure, pleasure and treasure. It's what we all exist for, it's what we, get, what we tick for and, 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 and get up in the morning to do. Okay, if we stick at the brain, if we stick at the paralysis, if we stick at the tongue that doesn't move, then that's necessary, but I don't think it's sufficient. Okay. So that's just to explain my philosophies and practice in rehabilitation medicine. Okay, it, doesn't stay, it doesn't stop at the brain. Now, this is just to put up there what I call the carbon chip computer, as opposed to the silicon chip computer, and it functions analogously, very similarly. It's got RAM, it's got memory, it's got connections. You have to have passwords, pathways, files, logins, and all these things. Okay. So that is just to put on, and just to, 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 to I mean, every time I read that, I don't fail to get fascinated by the fact that, you know, there are uh, there are more synapses in my brain than there are, uh, you know, stars in the galaxy. Okay? And that is in the brain in front of you. That is the brain that is either conscious or unconscious. Okay? So that it, it's, it's a fascinating organ. Okay? And for all that, it just uses two substances, oxygen and glucose. Nothing fancy. It's not using protein shakes. It's not using amino, uh, sort of amino acid derivatives. It's not using elements. It's using oxygen and it's using glucose. Very simply that. Okay? And of course, all these neurotransmitters busily taking messages up and down in microseconds uh, happens in this organ called the brain. Okay? And I mentioned remodeling and neuroplasticity because uh, 
the, uh, a lot of that is talked about these days in terms of how do people recover provided they survive. And most people who do survive a neurological condition do, do, do progress in some way or do change. And that is increasingly understood through modelling and neuroplasticity. And all this has, an, has, has relevance to the topic because what is the potential for recovery? Why do we, when and why do we make decisions for or perhaps not with, but for people in disorders of consciousness? What is the potential here? When do we say this is permanent? When do we say this is unlikely to have any change? And all that matters in terms of the science. That is a neuron, as you well know, um, which has a cell body and its connections to the periphery. Some of those can be several yards long if a message has got to go from your spinal cord to your left big toe to tell it to move away from a needle or a high um, a flame. So, and this is what we call the connectome, where if you strip down the brain as we would normally see it and begin to take away the substance of the brain and you're finally left with, with tracts. And that is the type of picture you get on an MRI, on a special type of MRI. Okay, and, and the MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging, but I've always said that the M stands for magic. It's, it, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. So we can study tracts, not just the cells, but that's called MRI tractography. Okay, and all these things matter because, why? Because patients or their, their relatives come and say, can you do this scan? Can you do that scan? What is the value of it? Um, will it change things? Will it change your decisions? Okay, what is the potential for recovery? So um, I never... Um, um, poo-poo uh, what might be out there, what is available. Uh, patients and relatives are far more informed than me. But my duty is to take that information and, and to compartmentalize it, make some sense out of it, and convert that information to what might be knowledge and, and, and how it's applicable to that patient in front of me. This is the picture most people would know anyway. And why I put it up is because that big, big bit over there, the pink bit, the neocortex, um, came, came later in evolution, and this is the brainstem or the paleo part of the brain, which is common to, to any mammalian um, neurological system. Um, so that pink bit over there is a computer that came much later and therefore has fewer backup systems. The backup systems are far more robust in the brainstem. So people in a vegetative state in disorders of consciousness tend to have a very robust brainstem, keeping you alive, breathing, beating, and, your, and all your hormones and temperature regulation going, but not thinking, judging, etc. So that is the part of the brain that is effectively de-efferented, or cut away from the rest of the, of, of the brain stem as such. It's almost like a functional decapitation. So your, 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 your thinking cortex is away. And that's just to put on the cerebrum or fore, forebrain. It's, it's, it's the biggest volume of, of brain substance within the cranium. And, uh, um, yes, and, and it's quite sobering to think that 80% of it, after all, is water. Okay? And when you say you're fat in the head, you're quite right, because the large volume of substance in the brain is made up of lipid. So 80% so, so of the volume of the brain is water. Okay? And, and that is what your MRI is feeding into. It's giving you a magnetic signal that knocks the electrons out of sync, and the time taken for them to come back into their resting state tells you which part of the brain you're in, because the electronic properties of water um, are different in different parts of the brain. Okay? People often ask me, where, so then where is consciousness in the brain? Does it have a locus? Is it in the brain stem? Is it in your reticular activating system? Is it um, uh, one side or the other? Uh, which part of the brain is, is, is injured, doctor, that they have this disorder of consciousness? And actually the answer is, like memory, uh, the total brain is involved in consciousness. And it's not a location, but it's a network. Okay? So the traditional teaching for right-handed people was that the left side of your brain was dominant and your speech and language resided therein. And that is largely true, uh, but it's only in very few situations where you can actually say this part of the brain is involved with that and not that. So traditionally, the visual cortex was the occipital cortex, your motor cortex was your front cortex, but some of those ideas are, are changing. And certainly for, 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 for those global functions like memory, consciousness, it is the total brain. Okay? Now, just discuss it. I, I just put that slide up over there. I've, I've, I've had a lot of contact with, 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 with Hindu colleagues and uh, have actually lived a long while in India and practiced medicine. And uh, the concept of consciousness um, has always come up 
in, in conversations, um, uh, generally after your third or fourth coffee, they don't drink very much beer then, but it's not my friends, it's, it's coffees. And consciousness, and where does it reside? And I went back into the Puranas, which is the, the ancient Hindu scriptures, and find that they've addressed consciousness in great detail. And I couldn't but think of the outer circle of the five senses, and that is exactly what we do as part of smart testing or any disorders of consciousness tools we use to test. We go through the senses again, and then we go to the integration of those senses, and then we go to awareness. And there's an awareness of your identity, who you are, the awareness of your internal identity, my bladder's full or my left toe is hurting, or the external awareness, there's a plane flying by. Okay? So all this has been looked at thousands of years ago in different cultures as to how and what we think. If this wasn't complicated enough, there are other diagrams of wheels within wheels of how consciousness is, 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 is being looked at in terms of lower consciousness, medium to intermediate consciousness, and how the ancient civilizations had tried to grasp where this consciousness lay and who was responsible for it, who determined whether somebody was conscious or, or, or unconscious. And something as complex as this, I, mean, I, know, I, I haven't read much of Carl Jung, but, uh, but, but certainly you know, um, in, in one of his uh, uh, treatises, um, just a simple concept, I thought, of mother, you know, would be self-explanatory. But these are the inputs into what you might think around the word mother, you know. I am a mother, other mothers I have known, I can equally say a father, my own experience as a mother, what I've seen written about a mother, what I've seen read about a mother, and it gets very complicated, uh, complex enough in, 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 in good hands, but complicated in, in certainly in my hands, where you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, privy to that sort of complex thinking. Um, now, I spoke about networks. I think it's important to understand that when you discuss consciousness, you are looking at networks. Okay? Something described um, in the laboratories in, in Toronto as well as in Stephen Laurie's laboratory in uh, Liège in Belgium is looking at networks. So the default mode network um, is one of these primary networks which is going on there in the background. Remember I said the brain was a computer? This is chugging away in the background, and it actually is a network that is activated when the brain is at rest. When the brain begins a task-specific function, the default mode network becomes inactivated. Okay? So your fMRIs, etc., are looking to see this network, which is the network that's activated when your brain is actually at rest. Okay? And those areas, which I marked what we call the precuneus and the posterior cingulate gyrus, um, are very important areas. And that's an even more fascinating scan it's called a functional MRI, where the redness or, or coldness or, or, or of, your, of the signal in the brain is picked up on the, number of, on the amount of glucose or oxygen that that brain is using. Okay? So the brain is not a passive downstream recipient of, of cardiac largesse. Let's send the brain you know, 500 mils of, of blood in this, in, this, in this cardiac cycle. The brain actually draws blood to it and says, this is what I need, okay? I'm asleep now, I don't need that much. Don't send me that much, okay? So the, the heart is not a central organ pumping blood out like a mechanical organ and everything in down, further downstream gets less and further upstream gets a lot. Organs, especially the brain, is involved in autoregulation. It can decide how much blood it actually wants. Okay, we'll skip that. I've referred to it in my talk as well already. And how does that work? I said in the resting condition. Um, some of these slides are also are, are all available for people to take away. So, so um, there's a lot of matter in there that I don't have to necessarily talk about, but which can support some self-reflection or self-reading. Okay, and um, the fMRI, as I said, is 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 a, um, a, a technique whereby all these different areas are evaluated differently and then integrated into a, a, a diagnostic tool. Okay. Now, very simply, the functions of the brain, uh, you may or may not have heard of the vegetative state, a, a, a term coined by Janet and Plum in 1972, and when they were writing their book. Of course, the state was known for centuries before that. Um, the French called it coma vigile, where you actually had your eyes open and almost kept... Um, kept um, 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 you look, looked out into your own coma, as it were. But um, the, the vegetative functions of the brain, unfortunately, too close a term to vegetable, um, and, and therefore, you know, uh, sloppy language, 
It just means that what are the vegetative functions of the brain, and when they, descri when they describe the state, they describe it in terms of what was left, not, was, not what was lost. So all that is left in these conditions is your vegetative functions. So your, your breathing, beating, hypothalamic function is left. And, that's, and, and, your, and, your, and the state is described in what functions of the brain remain, as opposed to what functions of the brain were lost. Okay? It's also very important to know that the nervous system works on hierarchies. It works on lateralizations, right and left, front and back, uh, higher versus lower. And of course there's activity and connectivity. When you have a traumatic brain injury and you have a blow to your head or you come off your bike, that part of the brain could be very severely damaged, but there could be other parts of the brain which are actually intact. And then comes a question about how do we know they're intact? There's got to be connectivity. So it's all about activity and connectivity and the balance between the two. It's probably worth saying at this stage that a traumatic brain injury is quite different from, let's say, a global brain injury where the whole brain doesn't function like after a cardiac arrest. The, and the entire brain doesn't get blood. And in that condition, really, which is a much more severe condition, almost two different diseases, the, um, the, the, the activity as well as the connectivity is lost. In traumatic brain injury or stroke, it's possible that there are areas of activity inaccessible because there isn't the connectivity. Now, uh, at the start of this lecture, uh, we might have all been somewhere up in the right top corner, quite conscious, quite with it, uh, but ten minutes into the lecture, you know, we're thinking, this man's just droning on and on, let's, let's, let's become slightly drowsy, maybe even pop off to sleep, and, but hopefully nobody going into a coma, okay? So, but if you are, wake up, you know? Um, so this is where we are. I put this, put this um, slide out among medical students uh, from St. George's, and I teach them as well, and uh, some of them are quite... Uh, quite either cheeky or just honest and say like, well, we're actually somewhere down here. Okay, could you, <laughs> could you speed up, please, and move, and move us somewhere out there? So this is very important to understand because we, we have a level of consciousness um, and then there's a content of consciousness. And when you discuss disorders of consciousness, it is that dissociation from what might be your perceived level of, or your, your assessed level of consciousness, your eyes are open, your eyes are closed, to the content of consciousness. So your Glasgow Coma Scale, for example, measures your level of consciousness. So your GCS of 10 on 15 or 3 on 15 talks about your level of consciousness. It says nothing about your content of consciousness. Now, I, I did mention about the brain taking blood and auto-regulating, self-regulating itself. So if you look at the cerebral blood flow states and the metabolism as a percentage uh, of the blood flow coming to it, you find that this is what is normal on this side. And then you find that, you know, at brain death levels, there is metabolism still happening in the brain, okay? Because um, it's either supported from, you're either on a ventilator and therefore your, 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 your respiration is supported and your heart continues to beat. But if you look at brain death, uh, where, there's, where there's death and there's nothing, um, and you look at, let's say, the permanent vegetative state, uh, pick, Pictorially, the permanent vegetative state doesn't look too far off the, uh, uh, let's say, deep, deep anesthesia and then deep sleep. But that percentage drop is hugely important. And people in permanent vegetative states are actually at levels of deep anesthesia, either surgically induced, uh, uh, um, surgical anesthesia or in, 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 in just, just below coma. So, the brain cannot function, the brain is not functioning when it has that degree of metabolism going on. Okay, it's ticking over, but it's not functioning. And that's one of the explanations I use. I use the slide sometimes to talk with patients and relatives about, yes, there's blood flow to the brain, but is it a useful blood flow? What is actually happening there in terms of metabolism and then function? Okay. This is another way of putting, putting down con disorders of consciousness and their states. I must say at this stage that this is when I discuss disorders of consciousness, I'm not talking about temporary ones, where you've had an anesthetic and you're going to wake up in a couple of hours, or you've had, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, you've been in a deep sleep and can't be roused because you're very tired. So these are chronic disorders of consciousness. They are, they, are, they are prolonged disorders of consciousness, which is a DOC lasting more than four weeks. So we would be here where our arousal and our awareness mechanisms, remember I said level of consciousness and content of consciousness? When those are constantly associated with each other uh, and our arousal engages our awareness and our awareness reflects our degree of arousal, that's a normal state. 
In coma, of course, is a state of eyes closed to total unawareness. Your eyes are closed. That's how the lay public um, would, 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 would perceive somebody to be unconscious. They're unconscious, doctor. Because their eyes are closed, they're totally out of uh, any, 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 any stimulation. But then you have that, that area, that twilight zone, where your eyes are open and you give, for all intents and purposes, a sense of arousal, but there is no awareness. And when there's no clinically detected awareness by behavioral means, we say the person is in a vegetative state. When there are some behaviors that can be explained on the basis of awareness, then that would be the minimally conscious state. And that is a huge spectrum, a huge spectrum, which can go from almost no behaviors or a behavior which you cannot explain on the basis of a vegetative state. And therefore they, by default, move into a minimally conscious state to very, very complex behaviors that, once again, do not satisfy emergence criteria from a minimally conscious state at the other end of the spectrum. And don't forget that the emergence from a disorder of consciousness is probably not an occasion to raise a flag or pop the champagne because you still emerge into severe cognitive, communicative, physical and sensory impairments. So just emerging from the state and families and families do expect a great change. When you say somebody has emerged from MCS, they actually expect over the phone when they come in to see somebody sitting up and talking with them. And that is not the case. That is just not the case. So people in the minimally conscious state have some behaviors. People who have emerged from the minimally conscious state by diagnosis have just moved out from a disorder of consciousness into what might be very, very severe cognitive impairment. Okay. This is another way I explain to patients. It's a platform. Okay, so you might have, because patients ask me, they say, but you know, but you need physiotherapy, you need to move those arms and legs, otherwise the brain won't get any better. And then you have to explain that actually the piece of plastic in your throat, your tracheostomy, um, the expectation that when the tracheostomy comes out, patients will begin to talk. And actually you talk with your brain, but through your throat. So you might have a perfectly normal throat, you might take the tracheostomy out, but if your brain isn't ready to formulate speech and language and articulate, it's not going to happen. Okay? So, so all those things might be intact. There's nothing wrong with your arms and legs. They would move if the brain injury improved. But when there's a disorder of consciousness, and this fracture occurs between arousal and awareness, and the brain is broken, then it's irrelevant what happens up there, because those pillars cannot be supported on um, um, an, an unstable platform. So it's, it's good to think of a disorder of consciousness as a platform diagnosis or a platform condition on which everything else is then made possible. And I've discussed some of this already. Now, disorders of consciousness. Classically speaking, and the guideline also develops it as the sudden onset catastrophic brain injury that puts you into a state of unconsciousness or coma. What about all those other thousands and hundreds of thousands of conditions that drift into this state either because of terminal dementia, terminal Parkinson's disease, of all the other conditions um, that drift into this state. So this is something I put up here, I've sort of developed it recently in terms of shifts and drifts. And that is the condition you are looking at. And I call it a syndrome because it has different causes, different behaviours, there are different persons involved and different outcomes. That trajectory is on the way down. Okay, either very rapidly or not so rapidly into a terminal condition and into death. This condition, provided you survive, can remain in that state for years if you're supported or show some improvement. Okay? So, so that's very important to look at when you say a, a prolonged disorder of consciousness. How have you entered that state? What is your trajectory? And where you're going is also very important. It's good for prognostication as well. Okay? Because somebody moving into that state might be a required state in terms of the dying process. In other words, you're moving into a disorder of consciousness because of, the, of your underlying pain, the treatment of that pain, and this is what's happened in, in hospices. I mean, you, you gradually get into uh, a state, your delirium is treated, you, you, you go into uh, increasing doses of morphine for your pain, etc. The primary aim, of course, is to treat your pain, but as a consequence of that, your sensorium or your ability to appreciate or be conscious might be impaired. Okay. The diagnosis of people in disorders of consciousness is still, and for the foreseeable future, will be a behavioral diagnosis. So all the other tests in terms of the fMRIs, the 
um, the EEGs, the near infrared spectroscopies, all these things are all theoretical and, 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 and research tools at the moment. So patients do ask me, can we, can we send this patient to Addenbrooke and Cambridge for an fMRI? Actually, it's not going to add very much at this stage. But if the person fulfills their very strict inclusion criteria, we then look at it in terms of a trial. Okay. And I've mentioned this before as well in terms of the vegetative state. We have to show cause. We have to show that the primary neurological pathways are intact. Okay. And if they're not, they might be not intact because a traumatic brain injury might result in, 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 in the loss of your eye. Uh, or in the, uh, the, the severing of the nerve for the ear. So we've got to be very, very careful that it's not the primary loss of the peripheral thing that then tells me that, that, that the brain is also lost. Now you have to look at all, all the primary pathways and then if they're intact it actually helps the diagnosis because then what you don't see is because of a brain problem and not because of a nerve problem. Okay, and finally there's a behavioural um, evidence of awareness. Now there are lots of clinical features but when people are in hospital, these are the things that happen and they can cause issues because none of these, none of these clinical signs or symptoms or signs are incompatible with the diagnosis of a vegetative state. So, you know, a typical grasp reflex, what a baby does when you put your finger into their arm, they just grasp it. That's a reflex. Okay. Similarly, you can have smiles, frowns, even laughter in people in the vegetative state. Okay. With, and with, with, who then go on to with serial observations, we proved to have no other, no other behaviour apart from that. So it's very unlikely that, you know, that under an oak tree you'd find one acorn. So when you find one behaviour, you're looking for other behaviours, other similar behaviours, which can then tie up with each other. It's very unlikely that you would have one behaviour appearing to just one person at one point in time um, and, and to nobody else. But that is the tension we have sometimes between families and staff and professionals. And the way to do that is to just expand the team, the rehabilitation team, to include the family. You're part of the team whether you like it or not, and that's what I tell patients and relatives. Whether you like it or not, you're part of this team now. What are your observations? I don't uh, have any restrictions on people videoing things, as long as the nature and purpose of that information is not to go onto YouTube, but to help the staff make judgments. I did see this doctor in the garden yesterday, and it happened again. Video it, show it to me. Okay. And, 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 uh, and that, that's, that's the information governance protocol and everything, but that's in general the advice I give. Okay. The minimally conscious state, as I said, is, a, is an even more difficult state because you actually have these behaviours. There is awareness. The question is, what's getting through? You know, the lights are definitely on, but is somebody in? What are they doing? Okay, what are they doing with that? Are they, are they, are they making choices? Are they experiencing something? Okay. You might have a smile and that depicts, for all intents and purposes, some sort of contentment. But a capacity for happiness comes with a capacity for suffering. So uh, reflexive responses to pain might then be experiential responses to pain. And that's what you want to, to, to really uh, think about and suspect and treat. Okay, so I'll just leave it on. I put this slide up over here. This is one of those other fMRI slides that actually show a normal control. Remember the previous diagram I showed you with the, the precuneus and the other parts which are involved in the default mode network. Um, that part of the brain is the highest in terms of consciousness. So that's a, con that's a normal control there. Okay. And then you have, that's a vegetative state. You can see it's very blue. There's hardly any blood. The blood pressure in that person, the blood pressure in this person are the same. You might even have a higher blood pressure in that person. But it doesn't mean anything. You think, but there's blood going to the brain. Why is it still blue? Because the brain is not using it. Because there is no function of the brain to use it. It's not taking up any glucose, it's not taking up any oxygen. That's why it's blue, it's cold. And then the minimally conscious state, getting warmer, okay, but certainly no comparison to the, the, the conscious control on, on, on in the top left corner. And then over here you have this condition called the locked-in syndrome, okay, which is not a disorder of consciousness by any stretch of imagination. That is a locked-in syndrome People are conscious, they're cognitively aware. It was previously assumed and med medical students would be taught that cognition is absolutely intact. They're just locked in, they're just de efferent they can't do anything, they can't speak, they can't talk, etc. But actually, depending on the tools you use, you can demonstrate quite a degree of cognitive impairment in these patients with the locked-in syndrome, which is why this picture isn't the same as that picture. So there is um, some um, 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 
uh, analogy to the, to, to, to the um, conscious state, because they're both conscious, but there are impairments. Okay? And I put that up there just to show you that the locked-in syndrome is not a disorder of consciousness. It is a very severe state of, of, of um, a very severe neurological um, diagnosis. Outcome measures. You see the vegetative state being just below death. Uh, that's the Glasgow outcome score. Okay. I've, sp I've spoken about this earlier, and I won't read the whole slide, but in traumatic brain injury, if there are no further behaviours to show that somebody is aware of anything, then about a year is the earliest at which we can make a diagnosis and say this is a permanent vegetative state. If it's anoxic brain injury, where your heart has stopped and your brain has had no oxygen, then that's six months. Uh, in the Royal College guidelines, the Scottish guidelines would say three months, New York would say three months, and that varies. So roughly between three and six months in anoxic brain injury is when, if you're not having any behaviours that show that there is emerging awareness, there are exponentially decreasing chances of that state changing. Okay, So you say it's permanent. But once again, the guideline calls permanent as not being never, it's highly unlikely. And the question is, what is the law, what is the guideline, what is the permissible practice? And as a jobbing clinician on, on the shop floor, it's very easy to get deviated, confused by what can be done, can't be done, should be done, shouldn't be done. At the end of the day, you don't want to break the law, but breaking the law is not the whole story. It's also looking at how that law could be fulfilled. In other words, what, what does the law permit? Now, it could be a logical or a slippery slope in the other direction. In other words, if the law said advance, there would be assisted dying and euthanasia. You know, would, we, would we go down that route? Are there some red lines some of us are just not willing to cross at all? So what are those red lines in our personal lives as doctors, in our personal lives with a belief system? What do our patients want? Because we are contracted in the service to provide um, um, care to our patients. Um, what is in their best interests? Will I do it? Will I not do it? Where will I do it? What, what about my organisation? What about the NHS? It's for, 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 for you, really. Um, I mean, I, I've stood here talking about the science and about the brain, but in terms of um, what is permissible and what is not permissible in this jurisdiction um, is, is something which every citizen should know about. So I put down this uh, unconscious brains, minds, humans and persons, what are the relationships? I mean, you are the experts in the room, uh, not me, but uh, I do have a view on these things. Um, I just put that up there and leave you 30 seconds to, to read that. These are obviously epitaphs. As part of my research, I did this in terms of looking at the epitaphs of patients who, had, who were in permanent vegetative states and then who, who passed on. And the word passed on is quite loaded, really. So, so you see, Nancy, Nancy Be Terry Schiavo was something more recent. Even George Bush waded into the whole um, uh, drama. And uh, Nancy, uh, Nancy Beth Cruzen, there was Carol Ann Quinlan before her. Um, there was um, 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 other people as well. So if you read this very carefully, you see, born such and such a date, okay, departed this earth on a particular date, and then at peace. In that, in, that, in that state, it's almost quite a number of years. Okay? So, something closer home. Tony Bland in Hillsborough, okay, in the 1980s, when the football stands collapsed, and 94 people died on the day. Um, and Tony Bland, who was only 17 at the time of his injury, and 18, by the and 18 and older by the time he died. Uh, if you read the statement over here, so this was a, 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 a labourer community from Keeley in Yorkshire, um, and this, this, this was a statement read at the coroner's uh, inquest. The young man we knew, we knew lost his life on the 15th of April 1989 and died in the hospital four years later. Okay? Now, I don't think this statement was put into their mouths um, very um, consciously, this was just read out. So there was a concept already that you could lose your life at one point and die at another time. So this temporal dissociation between when you lost your life and when you died was already there in the social consciousness. Okay? Now the law hates that. You can't, it can't have two days of death. It wants you to die once and for all. Okay? 
So, so, and it goes by what is the standard definition of biological death. Your c capacity for respiration and your heart stop, and that is the end of the matter in the majority of patients. Concepts were changing. Concepts were changing. They hadn't already changed by the time of Bland. They were certainly changing. And that was you know, the meaning and purpose of life, of um, the role of the body as a vehicle for consciousness and self, um, recognizing that some persons depart before they die. Okay? There are some elements of basic care, and this was one of the central arguments in the, in, in the Bland case, was where what, 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 what was considered till then to be basic nutrition and care, in other words, care for a patient, to, to, to hydrate them and give them food, was, was now called a treatment. And just as your doctor prescribes you with antibiotics or antidepressants, treatments can be prescribed, treatments can be withdrawn. So what was considered to be, hitherto considered to be nutrition and hydration, something that every human being required, now was a treatment. And therefore that was then, it could be withdrawn. And the withdrawal was discussed as an omission, not as an act. These were two of the central arguments in, in, the, in, the, in the bland discussion, where nutrition and hydration became treatments. Somewhere around 2010, the literature changes, and ANH, what was artificial nutrition and hydration, became CANH, or clinically assisted nutrition and hydration. What are the candidates you might have uh, in terms of um, which, if they're no longer present, you would say somebody is alive or dead? And uh, uh, there's been a lot of water under that bridge, as you can imagine. I've done some reading, but of course um, you would have done tons more. But what I'm just saying is that since Bland, it was possible to think, to do, to act, that some people do depart before they actually die or are allowed to die. And what was the basis of this? Was it the medical condition? Certainly in Bland it was, this person is permanently unconscious. The word permanent didn't exist at that stage, it was persistent vegetative state. The minimally conscious state hadn't been described yet. So there's no MCS, it was just PVS and the P was persistent. Now the only P is permanent. Um, and he was in a permanent vegetative state, permanent unconsciousness, um, would this be something that he would have wanted? Since September last year, the, the law has moved quite significantly in terms of its case law to say that whether something is, whether, whether somebody is in a vegetative state or not, whether, whether the cause of it is Huntington's disease or trauma, whether it's permanent or not permanent, at the end of the day, it's going to be best interest. What is in the best interest of that patient? And it's moving away from the best interest as an umbrella term to almost substitute a judgment. Lady Hale in Aintree versus James looked very clearly at saying, what would the patient have wanted? So best interest is almost being implied to be substitute of judgment, which is sort of the American standard in terms of what would the patient have wanted. And the role of the family there is, is increasingly important as well because they would know what the patient would have wanted. So um, if you come from a theistic um, background, then obviously uh, it's a self-evident truth. Human beings being created in the image of God had dignity, rights, and persons as an extension of that divinity. Um, contemporary um, scholars um, would, would, would look at it um, um, in, in, in other ways. And uh, um, I think the, the centrality of autonomy in, 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 in personhood, um, certainly from my training, etc., has been of a very Western Judeo-Christian um, uh, tradition of, of autonomy. And um, self-determination um, is paramount. How I determine how I live my life, etc., is paramount. But on the other hand, there is uh, another element to it, and that element could be how is my life laid out for me by a theistic, deistic source? How is, it, how, how is that related to my family um, it, it, or, or to my connectedness, my social connectedness? Um, so, so these are things which um, are, you know, can't be tagged on to the end of a, a lecture on a, on, on, on a Thursday evening uh, and certainly won't be teaching you this, uh, you know all about it. Um, but I'm just saying that as a doctor, my general medical counsel guidance or regulation is in that. I have to be very, very clear and try very, very hard to get all the information possible about my patients. What happens in Southeast Asia? What happens in India? What happens in, in other cultures where uh, there are different constructs of autonomy, where the, f the, the construct of the family is different? But, but really, it's, it's looking at, um, at, at um, 
at, at, at different dimensions and where an Eastern um, uh, view of autonomy is, is very much in two dimensions, a vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension. In other words, there's just there's, 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 there's the self, the self isn't complete until it is related. And it, 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 it is, the moral agent here is always a person in relation. And if you are not a person in relation, then you're not a complete moral agent. So it, it's very, it, 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 it's very, it's, it, it, it's, it's different to how we, how we approach autonomy over here and how we, 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 may, we, we enhance that autonomy or make decisions where that autonomy is not apparent. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm very aware that you know, the multicultural society we, we live in today um, has to take in all these considerations. And when I do have patients and their families sat in front of me and they're very clearly either first or second generation from Somalia or from India or from Pakistan or for that matter from Yorkshire, uh, you know, um, how do I have these conversations? Okay? Uh, what is their view? What is their view on decision making for their husband or daughter in this condition? Okay? Now, this is what all medical students are taught. I mean, OT students in the audience, etc., are taught all the principles of Beecham and Childress, and of course, they, you know, they, they help, but, but, but they don't necessarily solve problems, because what is beneficence on the fact that the doctor might not be, might clash with the patient's autonomy. So very clearly, you know, you think this is in the best interest, this is what you need to do, and the patient says, I don't want it. So that's an autonomy immediately clashing with beneficence. In the grand old paternalistic days of the arrogant and ignorant variety, um, that, that held sway, okay? But there are still patients, and there are still um, um, uh, families who say, Doctor, what, 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 do you, what do you advise? What, what, what should I do? Okay? And then do I be needlessly burdensome and explain the, the smallest print or the smallest um, side effect of a particular medication and then find that, well, actually they're going to decline the entire treatment, which is very good, on the basis of some small piece of information that really isn't relevant, but which in the, in, in the, in the cause of making people informed, you then have to, um, um, uh, you, you go down a pathway of being needlessly burdensome, I feel. Similar. This slide I'll put up there to, uh, to say, you know, and, and therefore is autonomy so critical a principle that when it is absent and permanently so, person in itself can be said to be irretrievably lost. Um, now, that statement I think a lot of people don't have autonomy, but they are sentient, they, they, they have behaviours that are pleasurable, they make choices, etc., but they may not have autonomy, okay, in, 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 in a classic true sense. So would we say that personhood is lost? I mean, I, I don't really subscribe to that. Um, but where I do have a better experience is in, in, in disorders of consciousness, where very clearly uh, there is no prospect of recovery, okay? And therefore, the chronic unconsciousness or permanent unconsciousness, the potential for recovery is, 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 is vanishingly small. I never say never, uh, vanishingly small, that the recovery of that personhood or the recovery of that exercise of autonomy is, is never going to happen. And, and in those situations, you have um, a, a body that is well nourished, well cared for, no pressure sores, spasticity taken care of, etc. But what do you do? Okay. The default mode, certainly, at the moment, is to carry on as we, as, we, as we have been. When we have the law, when we have regulators, when we have families saying, but you never told me. Okay. You've been feeding my relative for 15 years, but you never told me that since bland, we had an option of withdrawing nutrition and hydration and bringing about the death of my husband. You never told me this. Why didn't you? Okay. Is that because I'm uncomfortable with it? Is that because, from a Christian perspective, I, I value life or wrongly feel this way or the other? Um, or do I breach a duty of candor and keep that information to myself and not share it with somebody else? Oh, but it's in the public domain. You ought to have read it. Okay? So, so what, where do I stand as a professional? Where do I stand as, as a professional with a belief system, with a Christian belief system, as to how do I handle this? I have no answers, I'm just asking the questions, really, you know. And, and, and uh, um, it's, it's not easy at the cold face when you're faced with these things. Okay? And this is every day sometimes. I'm not in intensive care, which is talking to a few other people in St. George's is, a, is another nightmare. <laughs>
Okay, I'm months and years down the line, perhaps, with the benefit of time and hindsight. Okay, and there are competing definitions of death. I mean, the law has one definition of death, and that's it. Okay, but the question is, I mean, are there other candidates? Okay, and and regardless of what the candidates are, if you have, if if you if, if you value life. Um, um, only as a vehicle for consciousness, when that when that vehicle of, when that consciousness has departed, and permanently so, then is life of any value? Okay, and that's Jonathan Glover, who was part of the faculty at King's when I was doing my ethics and law. Um, and and this is one of those arguments where if you feel, you know, at the vitalistic end of the spectrum that all life should be preserved at all costs, then there's no argument. Um, but if you're, you're going to use proportionate means to use current terminology or, um, or ordinary means in the terminology of Pius XII um, to preserve life, then, 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 then there is obviously an extraordinary means you wouldn't extend yourself to. There isn't a disproportionate means you would extend yourself to. So these are day-to-day -day sort of decisions in terms of, um, of, of, of what, the, you know, is there a person there, is there a body is there anybody, there's certainly a body, but is there anybody in, in, in that unconscious state? Okay? Um, um, and I certainly, um, um, the more I've thought about it, look, as, look at death as more than just a, a biological phenomenon. Um, it's not a biolo biological reductionism that goes on where if you've lost that, you're not yet dead, but if you've lost this, you're dead. Um, consciousness would be a high candidate for that. Um, I wouldn't certainly go as far as Ronald Veach, for example, in talking about a lack of social connectedness as being enough to say that death has occurred. Um, yes, we all have, you know, I mean, Ariel Sharon remained in a vegetative state for, for a long, long time, but was forgotten by the world. Okay, so he died a social death, okay, a, an international social death, but biologically he was alive. Similarly, if you subscribe to ancestral worship and Shintoism, your ancestors are very much alive, even though they might have died 500 years ago. Okay, so it's this, you know, what I referred to earlier as the social um, and, and, and geographical constructs of death. Um, I know there are lots of flaws in the higher brain concept of death, etc. And what is the higher brain anyway, but in terms of, in, in terms of its functions of thinking, scheming, judging, loving, etc. When that is lost and that's permanently lost, then you have a breathing, beating body. But do you actually have a thinking brain? Is there a person there? And, and if that person is not there and not likely to return, would you or should you keep the body alive? What is permitted in law? What, what do our guidelines say? What do our patients want? What does society demand? 